Good morning. We have some people still floating in, so I'll start off by, uh, by just basically asking, who actually works in microservices already today? Yeah, kind of scary. So I guarantee everybody who raised their hand is doing it differently, because uh, that seems to be the nature of it right now. And I'm going to address that a little bit in my talk today. Um, so my name is Fred George. Um, there's a lot of things you could talk about that I, I've done in the past because I'm old. Um, but I think the sort of the most significant thing, assuming the clicker works again, there we go, um, is basically I, the thing that I tend to do is I'm a change agent within an organization, sometimes known as a disruptor. Disruptor is actually a formal title that the Harvard Business School now talks about. It's the sort of person you bring into an organization that makes sort of very radical changes. Um, and it's sometimes said with some of the literature, you know, this is a short-term job. You will get fired. Uh, so I'm kind of used to working, you know, four to eight months and then they'll fire me because they're tired of hearing all the disruption I'm causing. But I usually leave behind enough good that they hire me again somewhere else. Uh, this is my, one of my favorite job descriptions ever. Uh, I was described as a hand grenade being thrown into development. If you ever get a chance to be the hand grenade, you should take the opportunity. It's a lot of fun. So that gave me sort of carte blanche to do a lot of crazy things. And that sort of describes most of my career. I tend to be on the edge of technology. The things I talk about tend to be the things that are bleeding edge in general. If you're not doing the stuff I'm talking about, don't worry about it. It'll probably happen in the next five years or so. Uh, but don't feel bad about it, because your organization may not be ready for it. There are certain steps you want to take to get ready for these things. All right, the clicker and I are going to have an interesting dialogue today. So why is microservices happening? I was at the conference in Berlin uh, you know, in February, and we were talking about microservices, and James was there as well and speaking. And I heard stories from people I'd never even heard of these people before, on projects I'd never heard of before. And they were doing a very nice job of microservices. And so I, I began to think about what's going on that's causing all these things to happen at this particular time. And so if you look at microservices, it's not in a vacuum. There's all sorts of other things going on here as well. You can certainly got the cloud coming out and, and, and lots of new tools like Docker and Cassandra coming out. And you sort of look at that and say, that's, that's kind of nice. So these things ha seem to be happening at the same time and somehow related to each other. But then you got Agile and Programmer Anarchy and, and managerless processes. Even you know, Jeff was talking this morning about sort of the lead leadership instead of management sort of thing happening. And a lot of that stuff's being talked about. But we also we have new titles floating around. You know, we have DevOps and full stack developers seems to be coming into vogue now. And then you got sort of the business equivalents of these, the lean startups, the MVPs, and that sort of thing. And it's sort of a common theme I see through all of these things. And again, Jeff sort of touched on this, and that is there's just a huge drive to go faster. That, you know, the speed of what you're going at, if you're not going faster, your competitors will be going faster. And so one of the things that seems to be motivating this movement to microservices is this drive to go faster and a whole lot of enabling technologies, processes, and organization tricks that we're putting in place to make this happen. So uh, because we like log log charts, because we've been doing some of these, I, th I drew a few log oriented charts as well. Uh, so this is a log scale on the side. It talks about how long does it take to get hardware? I need hardware to run my systems on. How long does it take to get it? And so just starting back even in 1990, you know, this is kind of how long it took, three, about three to six months to order a big piece of hardware. And actually, that's a little bit of a lie, because generally you had to basically allocate the capital for this hardware in September of the year before. So like in September this year, you have to figure out all your needs for 2016, and you got to be right. You can't have too much or too little, you got to have exactly the right amount. So the lead times were basically horrible at this point in time. And then virtual machines came along, saying there's a way to carve up this hardware so I can sort of allocate it much quicker. But it's still the process some, would take some time to get some of these virtual machines allocated. You think this has been solved pretty easily, but I was with a client uh, just last year, and we tried to get a virtual machine put into their enterprise systems so I could run some uh, software on it. And they said, yeah, we can get this ready in a month. I'm saying, a month? Seriously? You get a virtual machine? Well, yeah, we're going to break some processes in the process of doing that, but we can do it in a month if we have to. And you're saying, okay, wow, you guys don't get it. 
Because it, for a long time now, we've been in sort of this world where the commercial cloud came along. And now it's no longer it's sort of take weeks for your IT guys to sort of get to this. You can go to a commercial vendor like an Amazon and get something in an hour or two or 30 minutes or something like that. We got really good at that. But even that, we didn't stop there. You now have Docker, which is you start running Docker in your enterprise, you can break up a new, new, a new container in five seconds or less. And so you have this huge acceleration. Now I went too far. All right, see if I can work to the end. We're going to need to change some equipment here. Are we up again? Ah, good. So the other effect that's occurring here is not only do you have all these things, but you now have an impact on the organization. To some degree, the organization, uh, what's the need for a capacity planning? This is a process that's institutionalized in a large company. I think he's going to turn the volume down. Okay. This concept of capacity planning is institutionalized. There's teams that do this stuff. It's part of the process. You have to have this. You have to allocate the capital. There's a lot of momentum behind these processes. And it's dead. If you're still doing this, your guys don't understand. And the whole concept of having a dedicated ops team to run this sort of thing, which was really important, or perhaps even set up your virtual machines to allocate, that's gone as well. You don't need that when you're running in these other environments. If you don't understand those sort of changes, you're not sort of seeing what's happening, what's driving the microservices. Because microservices depends upon being in the yellow zone. If you're stuck in the blue zone and you're trying to do microservices, you're wasting your money and wasting your time. All right, another log chart here. Let's talk about how long it takes to deliver software. So I'm going to re rescale this one a little bit. I'll start back in 1980. Um, that's actually well into my career, but I was in, in, uh, working for IBM at the time. And basically, I worked on a project in that, that time frame, and I got an award for the project because it turned out really well. And the project had started five years before that. And we hadn't had any delays. That was the schedule. And it was delivered successfully. I also worked on a project in the sort of same time frame that took three years. We had 1,000 programmers working on that project. And we delivered it on time. By the way, we made $1 billion with that software. It was a windfall. But you sort of look at that, and you sort of say, well, you know, that's a long time to sort of think about delivering things. And even in IBM, when I was still in IBM in the, late, in the early 90s, uh, yeah, we were getting a little faster like that. I was able to get pushed off, software out of my organization about once every six months. And then I sort of, you know, started adopting ob object-oriented programming principles and practices, and yet we were still delivering in three to six month cycles. So even that sort of technology kick didn't really help delivery cycles at all. And then we got a little bit better when sort of some of the Agile stuff comes along. And yes, this is a log chart, so a straight line down is a good, good idea. But Agile comes along. My first Agile project, we had you know, a three-month delivery cycle by, followed by another three-month cycle. And then we got to up to two months. We were getting a little faster. Uh, and, but projects weren't necessarily delivering any faster. Maybe some internally their iterations were fast and some other things, but these cycles are still pretty long. And then I got involved with some, some other companies doing some interesting things, and all of a sudden, very, very strange things happened. Uh, I call this A2 because it's sort of says Agile Agile or Advanced Agile or in, in my vernacular sometimes programmer anarchy, but we started doing things associated with organization structure that complement the idea of what we could do with software. And we got to the point where, yes, we were trying ideas out in a week. And then we got really, really fast. In fact, how fast do we get? And sort of how fast can you go in, in this, these sort of processes? So how fast can you go if you keep pushing the envelope? Well, I thought we kind of hit the limit a while ago, and it turns out it's not the case. So this is actually a GitHub stats, a live GitHub stats from our, from our project. This is about three years old now. And you do the arithmetic, we were pushing something new into production every three and a half minutes. So you think you're going fast now, you can go faster. Uh, again, never thought we'd ever hit this sort of number, but you know, as Jeff was talking about in the keynote, you know, Moore's law kicks in with software delivery as well. 
and we're getting brutally fast about how fast we can do these things. So that's a little bit of what's going on, and are you taking advantage of that? But you basically, there's, there's basically a lot of supporting structure around going faster, and it's not just the software process. It's also the organization impacts. So the other thing that's happening is we're solving a different type of problem. And I really get, get a grasp around this with the Kinefin model from uh, a guy named Dave Snowden. Snowden, unfortunately, is a, a very strange name these days, but this is not that Snowden, it's the other one. And Dave Snowden was a brilliant guy that understands problems and what problems look like. And he drew this nice diagram and sort of carved the world up in these types of problems. He said they're simple problems. These are the ones where the cause and effect relationship is very easy. This is the world of best practices because there is a best way of doing these things. This is where you put in place a manager and employees because the manager can teach the employees how to do it better because there are best practices. And he said, it's a complicated world. That's, the cause and effect is there, but it's much more convoluted. It's a little harder to understand. And it turns out, in that case, you have experts. But experts are expensive. So therefore, you turn around and hire grunts to sort of do what the experts tell them to do, and a manager to make sure it happens. This is a world of good practices, not best, because there are lots of ways of doing the job. And so it's called good practices. But you know, Dave didn't stop here. In fact, now it gets really interesting. He says there are also two other types of problems you can wrestle with. One called complex and one called chaotic. And again, trucker goes too fast. In complex, the cause and effect relationship is not discernible. Yes, if something happens, you can probably figure out why it happened, but it's not a predictor of the future. This is a world of financial markets. This is a world of Google advertising. This is a world where you're trying to figure out whether you know, this person over here is a good credit risk or not. These are not deterministic problems. And it's called chaos. With your, you have no idea what's going on. Cause and effect, you're completely lost. It turns out, depending upon what type of problem it is, you want to act differently. You want to organize differently. You want to work differently. Because there is no, in the complex world, because there is no concept of cause and effect, there is no role for the expert because he doesn't really know what to do. And so if you think it's, you have, just need to hire an expert, you're fooling yourself if you're that type of problem. Now then Dave Sutton also talks about it. He says most of the time you don't know what type of problem it is. You need to watch it. Watch how it acts. And he'll tell you which of these segments it goes into. And therefore you can sort of classify it and act accordingly. Now he also talks about one other thing here, and that is personally you tend to have a prejudice for what segment you like working in. If you happen to be a senior architect in an organization, everything in your world is complicated, right? You just need me to tell you what to do, listen to me, it'll work well. If you're a politician, everything is simple. You elect me, I'll fix it. You raise the taxes, it'll fix it. Lower the taxes, it'll fix it. It's that easy. Of course, that's nonsense, because it's one of these problems over here. So it tends to, I tend to be a guy, because of my nature and being a disruptor, I tend to love living on that side of the world because I think it's a lot of fun to have chaos in, in sort of complex situations. And so I tend to be prejudice myself that way as well. But if you think about it, a lot of problems we're working on now are more in that segment. When you talk about customer retention, you're talking about that segment. If you're talking about how to do your financial accounting, oh yeah, you're back in the complicated world. And you organize yourself differently. So we're solving different types of problems than we solved you know, 10 years ago because of the technology and some of these insights we're getting now. So why else do you want to basically worry about this sort of microservice stuff? And the other thing is your competition is going to do it if you don't. Because there used to be a lot of barriers to your competition coming in and basically attacking you. Jeff talked about sort of the disruption of occurring industries. People going much faster than everybody else. So first of all, all that you know, used to be if you wanted to get into a heavyweight business, you had to go buy some hardware. You had to find a million dollars somewhere to build, build hardware and put a development team together and get that thing operational. And that's a barrier for somebody coming in and attacking your business. That barrier is gone. They just go to Amazon and buy, buy what they need on the day they need it. And so those barriers are gone. And they have these huge software libraries that are free. I don't need my gigantic staff. I just have to pick some software off the shelf that's open source. And I have stuff that used to pay you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for. It's license fees. But it's even worse than that. Because at one level, also, you're having business pressures that are coming in. Silicon Valley is now a role model for how to attack businesses. 
They have technology stacks, they have processes that they're put in place, they have techniques they've done, they've grown from very small companies to very large companies. That is a role model for your competition to come after you. Follow some recipes those guys used. There's also very few inhibitors today for global competitors. There could be a team sitting in India, a little company sitting in India, who's attacking your marketplace, siphoning off your best customers because they're giving you a better product, gives the customers a better product. And one day you wake up and look around and says, okay, where's my revenue per, per customer? It's going down because all the best customers have been siphoned off the top by these competitors. And they can find your good competitors because of you know, all the marketing and niche marketing you can do with social media. So you're gonna get killed by your competitors unless you're doing this yourself. And that's kind of the warning we have to give companies. And again, Jeff said that very nicely as well. So let's get into microservices. Uh, there's a lot of uh, debate about what they are, what they aren't, but typically we tend to agree on these sort of principles. And these are basically, they're really small, especially compared to the SOA services of a yesteryear. Obviously I can't wander the stage. Uh, this was a definition that came up at the conference in uh, Berlin, the microservices conference. And the idea was if it takes more than one programmer to write it and, and maintain it, it's too big. It's not a microservice anymore. And I think all of us sort of, most of us kind of gravitated to this definition when it was proposed. Uh, they're very loosely coupled because loosely coupled services means they can be deployed faster and more independently. Makes us faster. Uh, it's okay to have multiple versions. I mean, this is kind of strange when you hear it offhand because why aren't you using the latest version of my software? and you, you, you try to push your customers to do that, but in fact, you like running multiple versions. If you have a new version coming out, you have a new service you're writing, then write the new version. Keep the old one running, because the old one's being used by other, other guys. Let it keep working. Deploy the new one, deploy the client who needs the new one, and you're up and running. You're faster if you don't try to turn off the old one. Again, going faster. Uh, services tend to have to sort of alert. If they don't, can't do their job, they need to sort of stand up and say, I can't do my job. We need our system to fail fast if something's going to go wrong. And we tend to have this philosophy that we, we stole from Google that says, if you do something interesting, you should publish it. Do not worry about who needs it. Don't wait until the site comes and says, do you need this for me? If you want to do something interesting, you should just publish it. And basically, the whole concept of application and what an application means kind of disappears in this environment. The borders are very, very loose among these things. Yeah, these may be trying to do this and just tries to do this, but then you, you see how many of these services tend to overlap. So those are sort of things we tend to agree on. So as I talk about the challenges, and that's what this is about, because this year, I, you know, I've talked about microservices for three or four years now, and, you know, and, and I've talked about what they could be, how to implement them, and this year I, I've been talking about the challenges, because it's not all rosy gardens. And there's a common theme to almost all these challenges. And that is, to some degree, we don't know what we're doing yet. Let's be honest about it. We don't know what we're doing yet. We're inexperienced. And so as we find something, it's like, oh, here's a trend. Oh, well, it's not a trend because somebody else did something completely opposite and it even worked better. So we're still trying to figure these things out. So all my challenges is kind of rooted in the fact that we're still learning in this process and it's still new. Again, I love the chaos world, so this, this is a very happy place for me. So our first challenge, um, and I kind of sometimes change my mind what the number one is, but you know, last night, this became number one, uh, the database. You gotta tear the database apart. If you have one of these big centralized databases that's your operational store, it is holding you back. Because every time you touch that guy, you gotta test every line of code to make sure you didn't break something. And this whole organization sitting around trying to make, very, make sure you can change this thing safely, migrate it, unmigrate it, all these other things. So you gotta fix that problem by getting rid of it. So it's kind of, a, this is, becomes really interesting when I talk to various clients about this because I, I sort of ask the question sort of, because I'm a troublemaker, I ask how many databases do you have? So I was talking to a client not too long ago, a ho large hotel chain, I was talking to the chief architect. First time I'd met him and so I kind of asked him how many databases do you have and he basically said, you know, I got three and I'm kind of embarrassed by that, I'm trying to get down to two because of course you should only have one. I said, that's very interesting because the right answer is 300. It was the last conversation we ever had. Which was fine because one of the things that uh, he was doing after this was going to talk about the new waterfall process with his vendor. It's like, I don't want to talk to you either, dude. 
So what do you really want to do is you basically are going to go and start using event buses. This is the new technology that a lot of the Silicon Valley guys are using. Use event buses to replace that big monolithic database. Uh, you, and then basically every microservice, if it needs persistence, has its own version of the database. But only the stuff it needs to know. Not all the other fields and tables and all that other nonsense. Just what it needs to know to do its job. We, and we can use lots of different languages. We use the appropriate SQL technology or non-SQL technology for that particular need. And it turns out as we've been doing this for just a little while, about 10% of the databases are uh, write, writable. Most are read-only. And of that 10%, only about 10% of those tend to be transactional. And that has a profound implication, because just because I have a transaction-oriented system for that guy over there, all the rest of us are not stuck with using Oracle or SQL Server in order to do our databases. We can use the things we think is appropriate, which makes us faster. So what does this event bus sort of stuff look like? Well, one of my favorite sort of models, and, and I drew this picture as I was playing with my new iPad as I was flying across country a few years ago. And that is, this is sort of my, my metaphor for what I'm trying to build. And the idea is there's a rapids. Rapids is every message from every place. Everything interesting is in the same stream of information. And I call that the rapids. So not only the messages from the servers are there, but also the log files. Every time you're logging something, you're doing something interesting. Publish it to the world. Traffic stats in the log. Server stats in the log. Put it on that rapids. So every message is flowing there. Now, of course, that's a lot of information. So you call, it, call, call out things you need to sort of look at more closely into a river. It's a slower moving body of water. And typically, you'll hit your services into there. There is still a need, however, for entities. So yeah, we can kill the entity-oriented database for operations, but it's still a very important reporting technology. Reports and SQL databases make a nice family. So there's a need to sort of have what I call stagnant areas, where you just have the current state of something. But you kind of lost all the time value nature of it because of that. And I call those the ponds, because they're relatively stagnant. So how do you build such a system? Uh, well, you need a high performance event bus. And so one of my favorites, and there are getting to be more and more of these out here, but one of my favorites that I sort of understand at least to some good degree is Kafka. So Kafka is a persistent bus. It is the bus behind LinkedIn. So every time you touch LinkedIn or somebody touches LinkedIn or looks at your profile, events are being generated like in the droves to this Kafka bus. And they have a little application looking at this, looking at your trends, looking at who's doing things, scoring you, suggesting people you want to talk to, all these little apps running off that event bus. And the lovely guys at LinkedIn gave this software away. This is one of these open source projects. This is now an Apache project. The documentation on the Apache site is amazing. It explains why the bus works, how, it, how the redundancy works with the bus, how it's super, super reliable, how to, and, how, and how actually it's very, very dumb bus. But it's also a very fast bus because it is dumb. You can put 250,000 messages a second on this bus. You gotta have a pretty big application before all your log files and all your events are gonna drown a 250,000 message bus. It turns out though, they, when they say 250,000, they mean 250,000 messages. But if you write a message once and read it 10 times, that counts for 11. So you gotta be careful how many things you attach directly to this bus. And so we tend to attach things that then attach other things. And these basically are the rivers. So you're pulling off all the messages that have a certain trait and handing those to corresponding services, and you sort of build those a lot with ZeroMQ or some of, you can do a RabbitMQ um, to make that work. And you can sort of hang a few rivers off this bus, and they're the guys that are really listening for the messages. And it's okay to have rivers off of other rivers, so you want to keep you know, filtering messages. And basically what you do then is you take this and you put your services attached to this system. I'm definitely not going to move far from here. So you attach your service to this system basically by, you listen to a river, but you're always publishing to the rapids. You don't publish to a river because then people may not see your message that want to see it. Always publish to the rapids. So the rivers keep me from at, basically listening too many times to the Kafka bus, but the services themselves hang at that point. So this actually allows us to start building incremental applications. Uh, you have another name for that, James. Uh, your little hashtag is never done? 
Yeah, so James calls this never done. I, I call it incremental applications. It's the same concept. And so if you have this sort of, let's say I have a system that's basically a car rental agency. I'm trying to put some advertisements to sell you more goods on this car rental agency. So I got a, just a website. And the way you would typically build this application incrementally is you get yourself an event bus. Could be Kafka, could be RabbitMQ, could be one of the other buses from Amazon. Build yourself a little service to interface the event bus, and then you write some guys that can offer brands, offer some advertising to go into spots. So you say, the event bus basically says, you know, I got, a, I got an opportunity here, and these other services wake up and say, here's some answers. And then I can sort of continue to refine this application. I can add, oh, let me tell you about the membership of this, of this person. Maybe I'll tell you what segmentation they look like. You know, are they a road warrior? Do they rent on the weekends? Which will buy us what sort of offers I want to give them. And I just keep adding more and more things to the system all the time. The original system works fine. The subsequent system works better. And I continue to deliver this process. This is what we're doing whenever we do three and a half minute deliveries. We're continually tweaking our system, making it a little smarter. So you look at where the databases are in this world, you can sort of look at this guy. So you open up rental offers, what you really see is this, there's a little piece of code called the event publisher that says, oh, I have a need to have some advertising. He published a little event to the bus. His job is over. There's another guy sitting on the bus, solution collecting, who's waiting for these answers to come back, hoping he gets some. He could get lots of answers, getting a few answers, and he sorts through the answers. But what he does is he takes the answer he's coming in, he sticks it in a little database. Redis makes a good database for this. Then you got another piece of code up there that's going to wait for 300 milliseconds because I'm supporting IE6, unfortunately. He waits his 300 milliseconds and says, oh, okay, what's, what's my best offer right now? Pulls it down. But of course, more offers are coming in perhaps after 300 milliseconds. That's fine because the next time we come in there, we'll already have this cached. So there's a little microservice, and he has a little persistent database, Redis, helping solve his problem. That's the idea, these little databases popping up in the microservice on their own. I'm not running some gigantic query against some Oracle database. So looking at the membership service, pretty straightforward as well when you think about it. There's a little guy sitting there saying, if a, if a packet comes along and it, has, it needs some membership information, I'll add it into the packet, I'll enrich the packet. And I'll pull that from basically a key value store. You know, if it's Sally, here's Sally's a platinum. I just look that up, put it in there. But of course, I also have a little microservice that refreshes that database every night. Runs some ETL process against the data warehouse, puts it into a key value store. And by the way, if it didn't run tonight, that's okay, I'm using yesterday's data. That's okay, I'm still running, I'm still running my system. But again, a little database sitting in the middle that just provides exactly what the membership needs, but no more. So that's the database story. You gotta take that gigantic thing, probably kill it off in favor of of other technologies splitting the database apart. Uh, one of our colleagues at the, uh, at the uh, conference in Berlin talked about the first thing he did with his gigantic Rails app that basically fell over the first day he showed up was he said, I tore the database apart. Didn't try to turn it into microservices yet, just took the database and turned it into lots of little databases so they were completely independent of each other. Now I can start playing. That was his first step. All right, challenge number two. We have a bit of a debate amongst ourselves in the, in the microservice world about should we do synchronous services or asynchronous service. By synchronous service, I mean take that application you currently have, which has all these modules, and let's turn each module into a service. And instead of calling across these boundaries with dynamic binding, we'll actually do a RESTful call. Now we're doing services, right? And I say, yeah, you're doing services, but are you, did you gain anything from that architecture? That's a synchronous architecture. But can you do asynchronous? Can you do things in parallel now for a change? So let me go a little bit more about the asynchronous stuff. And by the way, it's, it's still an interesting active debate amongst us. Uh, in fact, Chad Fowler, again, our colleague from uh, in the old days in ThoughtWorks, and I were on the same stage in Dublin uh, talking about microservices a few years ago. And we said all the same things about it. We agreed on all the principles behind microservices. They're small and et cetera, et cetera. And so Chad wrapped up his presentation by basically saying, you know, my recommendation is you should use synchronous because first of all, that's the way the algorithms are described to you by your customer. And frankly, we programmers, that's what we're used to. And so it makes us faster. So I stood up after Chad and I agreed to everything Chad said, except for the whole synchronous stuff is nonsense. You don't want to be synchronous. You want to be asynchronous because this is going to give you robustness. This is going to give you the ability to run easy A-B testing. 
And yes, your programmers don't know how to do this, so let's teach them. And that's been my philosophy in organizations I've tend to work with. So what do I mean by asynchronous services? I basically mean there's a, some patterns emerging about how to work with these event buses. So I call this particular pattern the need pattern. Because basically the idea is you have your nice high power bus, you have a service, and he expresses a need. And hopefully some people are listening for that need, but he doesn't know that. He has to worry about the case where nobody's listening. So these guys receive that need, decide, yeah, I can satisfy this need. They may provide one or more solutions, each one of them. And the original guy collects these solutions, and he picks the ones he likes the best. Pretty straightforward architectural pattern, kind of actor-oriented based, but it has some huge advantages. Because it's very easy, in fact, in this one, to go write version two of the blue service and just deploy it. Don't take version one down. I don't have to tell the green service about it. I don't have to tell the yellow service about it. I don't even have to even tell the blue service about it. But version two is up and running now. Let's see if it gives me better results. If it does, then it'll kill off the old blue one. But I can try that so easily. So the A-B testing is kind of built into the architecture. The ability to try things out is very easy. But also, this is a very sort of a very graceful degradation. If the green service goes down, okay, I'm not going to get as many offers coming back, but the rest of the system is still working. I'm still getting offers. Now, of course, the system will be screaming bloody murder. The green is gone. It's going to get green back up. But meanwhile, the work still gets done. And for the complicated world, yeah, this doesn't work so well because I've got to synchronize everything. But for complex problems, this nails it. This nails complex problems. So we have architectural patterns like this beginning to emerge. Uh, just quickly, a little animation of this. So again, the rental car example. So you know, a web page gets served. We put a message on the bus. The message gets received by the corresponding services that care about these things. These guys will get that message. And these guys will suggest offers. You know, they'll have a different idea of what they could offer the client. So this one has an A offer. The other guy says, I have a B offer. These guys collect the solutions. Dun, 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 dun. There we go. And you basically push those to the workstation. And you got A and B. Now Sally logs in. Now I know it's Sally. That's a new event. Because before I didn't know who it was. But now I know it's Sally. So that creates another message. Notice it has a little more content to it this time. It's filled in. Everybody cares about the Sally message. So that goes basically to everyone. Again, I get different offers knowing it's Sally because one of the things we know from our industry is if you already have a customer, retaining them is way cheaper than trying to buy them back. So if you have a existing customer, you want to treat them very nicely. So we've got some more offers coming back in. And again, we'll collect those offers. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we get some information about her, uh, her segmentation or membership. We know Sally is a platinum in our rewards program. This means she's a very, very good customer. She spends lots of money with us. We do not want to lose her to the competition. So we have even better offers. So we'll publish that message to lots of people, and they'll begin to offer better messages for her. So that message goes out to these guys, they have different offers, etc. And the same thing will happen with segmentation. We'll find out she's a road warrior. She rents a car during the week. Because she rents during the week, she's probably not paying for it. It's her company paying for it. She doesn't care about a discount offer. So again, these things sort of work as well. So this is an example of an asynchronous algorithm where I can keep enhancing it. And it sort of has this sort of shape of a taxonomy, this need architectures. Basically, I have a different little microservice for each type, of each type of device I'm supporting. If it's IE6, it's running for 300 milliseconds to give you an answer. If it running against the latest Chrome, I can use WebSockets and push the answer there. Use a carousel as a front end. If I'm working with email, I go to run this as a batch process and get lots of answers put into my email. But again, same sort of channel interfaces. I have a whole set of services here, types of services that are servicing this sort of need. I have certainly solution services, the guys in yellow that are giving answers. You have the guys at the, on the side of my example, which are in blue. They're the ones that are giving compliment, new information, adding information to it. I can actually keep track of what I showed Sally, and if she doesn't click on an ad, then perhaps that ad's not appropriate for her. I can degrade that ad. That's what the client biases are doing for me. And finally, I can have solution blockers. 
I can say, well, look, Sally already has a reservation in Houston. Do not offer her a discount in Houston. She's already agreed to the deal. Why do you want to give the money back? So you have lots of those guys doing this. You have a solution collector that's pulling these things together. And one of the really essential parts of the system is you're always monitoring and logging things, including KPIs. It's very easy to write KPIs into the system because of the event bus is there, which means I can measure everything I care about from a KPI perspective. How much money did I make? How many clicks did I get? What's page retention time? How many logins did I get? How many registrations? I can track all those things as KPIs and see how my system is really behaving. So that's the architecture behind the asynchronous. So again, it's a little strange to develop in this environment, but it pays a lot of benefits in terms of how easy it is to deploy new things. So the three and a half minutes was this environment, working in things like this. All right, third challenge. And there's seven all together in case you're counting. So number three will be, is it microservices or is it closure? Re closure is functional programming. These are two hot technologies that seem to be very useful. Yet at some point they seem to be at odds with each other. And it's causing me some confusion. I'm not a closure expert. I'm probably not even, I'm not even a good closure programmer. But I've been working with a lot of good closure programmers that are. Because microservices in my mind is almost like objects at some level. They tend to have a lot of things that are very object oriented about them. They try to be really small because they're doing exactly one job. You want to make sure it does that one job really well. And it kind of has encapsulation the way it keeps its own little database of what it needs. It doesn't share its database with anybody else. So it kind of feels like an object. And some of my designs around microservices you know, depend a lot upon my design and objects that I've done in the past. But you look at closure and your know, functional programming, and it's basically these functions. And, they, and basically, they love shared data. There's no encapsulation here. They like shared data. Because fundamentally, the shared data is not changeable. You can only make new data, not change the old data. And so when you build one of these programs, you typically build a series of transforms. It takes your data from one form to another. So when I worked at the Daily Mail, um, we basically rewrote the front end of the Daily Mail. And the front end of the Daily Mail used to be rendering the pages with 130,000 lines of Java code with JSPs and everything else like that. We rewrote it in closure. Instead of 130,000 lines, it's now 4,000 lines of closure. So there's certain problems that functional programming languages are a silver bullet for. This happened to be one of them. But if you look at this, the way these pass information back and forth, it started out with a JSON structure of the page, which was, uh, here's a page, and here's some articles, and articles have headings, and headings have you know, pictures associated with them, and pictures have captions, and there's text, and all these things, a big JSON structure over the page. It ran through a series of transforms created to an HTML equivalent. Again, a killer application. But you look at these intermediate structures here, and they're like hashes of maps of arrays of hashes of maps of arrays of hashes of maps. And you sort of say, what other service wants to use that data structure? Because it's highly tuned to the next function only. So there's no reason to sort of make that a service at some level and publish that API. And so there seems to be a conflict between this idea of lots of services and functions. So, you know, we play with this closure in microservices at three companies I've worked at in the past so far. So one of the first companies that did the microservices at, back, going back to 2008, was a company in London called Forward. We did lots of strange things. But we had over 300 microservices. A lot of stuff I talk about came out of those guys. We used lots of different languages. You know, most of the time, Ruby was our language of choice for rendering front-end front -end stuff. Uh, we used a lot of Node to track various things and API things, so all our monitoring was done with Node. Heavy lifting algorithms were done with Closure. Occasionally, some analysis would be done with R, and a little bit of C++ shown in, but lots of different languages. In other words, different services use different languages, the language that's appropriate for the service. Uh, originally, we sort of used a database and cron files. Uh, we got into RESTful interfaces and Kafka buses. Then you move on to look at the Daily Mail, where we did this. And we basically had three services that were running Clojure, and then dozens and dozens of small services running Node.js. The Clojure services, some of them were 2,000 lines of code, not a micro at all. The average size of the Node services were 14 lines of code. So yes, we had microservices, but the Clojure didn't fit that model very well. And then I worked at a startup that did a lot of optimization engines, things like customer retention, uh, supply chain management, offer engines. We used Clojure a lot in that environment. We started with 25 services, and the number dropped. 
because there was no use to put boundaries between them. So three different answers. Um, so where do I stand about this stuff? I'm, I'm confused. I, I think closure should, should fit in this world, but I'm not so sure it fits with microservices. There's a new hope on the horizon, you know, and thanks to Dave Thomas sitting way back in the corner there. Hi, Dave. Um, Elixir, which is a, basically a functional programming language built in the Erlang virtual machine, which means there's just tons and tons of little things doing little functions. And I'm like, wow, that kind of feels like microservices again. So I'm, I'm just playing with this language when I have some time. Uh, I had a conversation with Dave last night on the boat, and Dave was kind of very encouraging that this, this does work. All right, fourth challenge. Architectures and frameworks. What are the architectures and frameworks we can use like right now? And the answer is, we don't have any. Or we have some candidates, but we haven't got the established spring frameworks, or the rails, and those sort of things don't exist yet. The good news is, we're getting lots of candidates. So, you know, thank goodness for Adrian Cockcroft and his team because they basically built us Netflix, which I love Netflix. I can travel the world and use Netflix. But the, ne what it, Adrian Cockcroft did was he took this entire, almost this entire stack, over 40 projects, and open sourced them. Open sourced 40 projects. The US Department of Defense is using this to build their sophisticated systems. So if somebody told me I gotta build a very sophisticated system, it's gotta be absolutely right and stuff like that, I'd probably dust off and use the Netflix frameworks. Because they work for a very big company and other people are using it as well. But it turns out the community is really going crazy for microservices, it turns out to be the node guys. Because very small services and very, very clear boundaries are part of the node philosophy. Here's one out of, a, out of a Ireland, Seneca. There was another one I never heard of before, Pagato. Um, based on 0MQ, which I kind of like that idea. So not, there are a lot of these things emerging, but we haven't got any winners yet. So that's one of the problems we have, is you don't have something you can say, oh, this is the stack to use. It was too early to tell. All right, the other problem we're having is, uh, sort of comes because you know, we were very comfortable back in our world about design patterns book. We have not got the design patterns book for microservices yet. Now, I described a need pattern. That's not written down anywhere other than my charts. We haven't got that book. We haven't sort of gotten together as a community to figure out what the good ideas are. But we're talking about it at least. And I think that's sort of key. So all those guys that raised your hand, if you're not talking about your microservices, you're doing us all a disservice. We need to understand what you're doing and what seems to be working for you to see if we can find some patterns. Because we need our designs patterns book. The nice thing is there are lots of conferences now talking about it. Today we have a track with five different speakers that talk about microservices. Two years ago, you, you, find, you couldn't find microservices on the agenda. And now we have an entire track. This is the Berlin conference. Good news is that it happened. It happened. It'll happen again next year, I'm sure. Uh, there's going to be one in September in, in Poland. Um, it looks very, looks very interesting as well. It'll probably bring the right speakers together. And there are lots of user groups. And this is where the real sort of thing is happening. These user groups are springing up everywhere. Silicon Valley obviously has one. There's one in London. Uh, there's one now in, in, uh, in Ireland and Dublin. Of course, they have the best logos. Um, but that's happening. So if you're, not, if you're not talking about what you're doing in one of these forums, create yourself a forum and talk about it, because we need our design patterns. Challenge number six. You need microservices by themselves cannot stand by themselves. If you just try microservices and not do anything else, you will probably get no success. So it really does depend upon a lot of other things, Techno not only just technologies, but also processes and your organizational structure. So I kind of started out by showing this picture originally this morning and talked about microservices, but you need to sort of look around here and pick some of these other things, because microservice by itself is not going to get it done. You need to sort of pick some other things to play with. So you may need to sort of rethink the job titles, to create the DevOps concept. You certainly better be using the cloud or maybe Docker. You better be thinking about how to use some of these non-SQL databases instead of putting everything in SQL, because it's not necessarily the right answer for everything. And you probably got to rethink some management processes. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of managerless processes. I believe in leadership, but not management. Uh, Jeff talked about that a little bit this morning as well. But you need to pick some of these things and make sure you're kind of working with them. So if you haven't got co-requisites, you're probably not going to have success with microservices. So my final wrap up is a little bit, you know, in challenge number seven is we're still wrestling with the concept and everybody has their own about what is a microservice. Mine tend to be really small, I, I love asynchronous, but that's just my definition. There are lots of good definitions out there for it. 
I think one of the things we have to be very careful of in the microservice community is not screw that up like we did at Agile, where everybody's Agile automatically. What does Jeff show this morning? 53% of people say they're doing Agile, but those 53% are not delivering every iteration or every, every sprint. So what are they doing? So we need a taxonomy. You know, my favorite taxonomy right now would have at least these three components. I'd like to see how, big, how many servers you have and how big they are, some sort of ratio there. I'd like to have some idea about how much synchronous you are or not. So you're, if you're very synchronous, fine, you can be that way. By the way, Netflix is very synchronous. Or are you very asynchronous, like some of the stuff I play with? And you can't be all 100% one or the other, but you can try to get closer to one than the other. And your database ratio, how many databases do you have? You say you got two databases and 50 services, I don't think you're micro. We had a presentation in Australia, uh, where I was at a few months ago, and the guy says, you know, talks about how fast they're deploying, and they're deploying, you know, twice a day. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really cool. And he said, yeah, we can deploy twice a day as long as we don't have migration scripts. And I'm like, whoa, okay, you just constrain the things I can do by a lot. So, by the way, what does that tell you need to do? You need to fix the concept of needing migration scripts, and you can go faster everywhere. So you gotta fix that problem as well. If you haven't fixed that, I don't think you're in micro yet. So I have a sort of a, again, a, my sort of diagram of things that look, look like this. So this is kind of my taxonomy and definition, is that, again, two log scales in this case. So this is log on both scales. So I kind of define that this, this space over here is kind of, I call the Rails in Java zone. So it's one big app, lots and lots of lines of code. And then we kind of have the SOA world as it emerged. So going back to the, sort of the you know, 2005, 2006 area, when SOA started, came available, you know, Credit Suisse is sitting there, they're writing services that are 10 to 50,000 lines of code each, they got 10 or 20 of them. So they're kind of sitting in that blue zone. I kind of think this is where microservices live. Whole different ratio and size of services associated with that. Uh, so that's where I, I used to work in this environment. I never want to do that again, it's too painful. I will not work on big apps anymore. Uh, this, the animation I was showing you about, about uh, you know, offer engine for rental cars, it sits about there on the model. Uh, the company I worked for Forward, they did a lot of these, the 300 microservices, this is where they sat. Nothing was larger than 100 lines of code, and they had over 300 of them. Uh, this is Netflix. Netflix services are much larger, they tend to be 1,000 to 2,000 lines of code written in Java. They're also synchronous. Uh, but they have over 300, they have, I think, 800 of them last count. That's what I heard, over 800 services running that size making your Netflix work. So this is the taxonomy you're looking for. So when you talk about microservices, at least you begin to plot yourself in a couple of these dimensions so I understand what you're saying and how you fit. So that kind of wraps up my challenges. A lot of, a lot of in front of us, we're getting some very clever solutions to these things, but if you really want more information then basically the answer is the same as always. Google it. It's out there. Lots of stuff is out there. And if your stuff that you're doing has not in, been in blogs and posts and stuff like that, Please get it out there so we can index it. But certainly the microservice architecture stuff, there's a lot of videos that talk about that. The micro exchange conference is beginning to put their things online. I think somebody just checked the other day, the first five up were all in German. So if you speak German, you're in good shape. Otherwise, you need to wait a little while for James and my presentations to be up there. Uh, and Google for, Google for the other things about programming anarchy, which is the, sort of the corresponding management processes that sort of make this thing run very fast. Thanks. Thank you.